Hi everybody, so welcome to the last talk of this afternoon. Uh, now we have Tommaso Bellilacqua with two M's, correctly. Two M's, sorry. Uh, <laughs> who is from the University of Milan and he will be speaking about balancing domain decomposition by constraints, preconditioner for divergence, pre virtual elements, uh, discretization of this observation. Sorry for the title. <laughs> sure it's a bad title. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Of course. Very nice. Point towards the laptop? No. Okay, just tell me I will go back. No. You can also spin it. The pointer? The pointer is there. No, it's the first one. Ah, thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, the organizer for this event and uh, to give me the possibility to present this work. So this uh, work uh, is joined with uh, Simone Scacchi, that is my advisor of the uh, University of Milan. And today I present uh, the, the BDC preconditioner for uh, a virtual and discretization of the Stokes equation. So today we will see uh, the simplest case in two dimensions and we start looking at the classical Stokes problem, we define the virtual element methods, we see the domain decomposition technique, uh, we define the preconditioner, and uh, finally we see some numerical results that we have obtained with uh, our simulation. So we consider the uh, classical Stokes problem with uh, homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. Omega is a subset of R2, we have to find the couple of velocity and pressure that satisfy the, these two equations. Here nu is the viscosity of the fluid. And for us it's uh, simply as a constant, but it can be an L infinity function. Uh, U is the velocity, P the pressure, and F is the external load term that is an L2 uh, function. So we introduce the space of function for the velocity, is the space H1 zero square, and for the pressure, the space L2, zero. So functions that are in L2 with the mean null. And uh, we obtain a classical standard variation of formulation uh, with the beginner form A, that is the uh, integral of the tensor product of the two gradients. And uh, B is the uh, beginner form of the divergence of the velocity function tested against uh, a pressure. We have the uniqueness uh, existent and uniqueness uh, of this problem by classical book of breath and forth then. <laughs> and uh, so we are now ready to introduce the virtual element methods. I don't know if uh, all of you are familiar with this uh, kind of methods, but uh, we can, uh, inter let's see, the main aspects of them. So they were born uh, in the 2013, principally with this uh, uh, article of Beirao and uh, other authors. And they were born as a, a generalization of the finite element methods applied to a, a mesh where the geometry of the elements can be very uh, arbitrary. You can have a, a different uh, a polygon of different shape and so on. They uh, recently have been uh, uh, developed and, and extended to a various uh, type of problem like Poisson, Navier-Stokes, Stokes, uh, uh, some kind of mixed form or discretization. This is uh, just a little of the uh, literature that is present uh, now uh, related to this uh, method. We'll see just the just few topics of the them. Uh, the fact uh, that they can uh, uh, that you can handle very general mesh uh, gives you some advantages. For example when you have to refine some specific region of the mesh, for example, when you have to, um, you have, when you have to do some uh, adaptivity. And uh, in this case, uh, for example, you don't have any problem, problems because these uh, four squares, where uh, here we have uh, some hanging nodes, are not a problem because they are treated simply as uh, some octagon. And this is not a problem for the virtual element. Also, you can, hand, uh, you can uh, handle like uh, fractures in the mesh. You can uh, simply add some nodes and you don't have any problem to handle this type of elements. And also, you can uh, uh, use them when you have to uh, collect data from different discretization of uh, 
some uh, space and you can collect uh, uh, glue together some different discretization of a mesh without any problem. The main uh, aspect of the, the virtual element method is the fact that the, uh, their space of function is made by polynomial function that uh, uh, are uh, used to, uh, to guarantee the convergence of the method plus other uh, virtual function that remain unknown. That they are usually, they are practically defined as solution of the PDEs that uh, are uh, related to the uh, differential problem that you are studying. And uh, the fact that characterizes uh, these methods is the fact that uh, to handle, uh, to, uh, to approximate the bilinear form, you have to integrate only polynomial function and not uh, complex function. Also, they satisfy the patch test. That, that is a quite good uh, property for uh, all the engineers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here we can now define the local space. We just define the local space because like in the finite element uh, framework, you define the local space and then you glow them together to obtain the global space. So we uh, introduce our decomposition of the mesh with the uh, general, uh, general polygon K. We define the a, with HK the diameter and with H the soup of this diameter. We also had to introduce some uh, uh, space of function, like the polynomial up to degree K, the space BK on the partial K, that is uh, a space of function that are continuous on the boundary of each element and restricted to their edge are uh, a polynomial of degree K. A space GK that is defined as the gradient of the polynomial of degree K plus 1 and its uh, L2 orthogonal component. So we can define the local virtual element space and for the velocity we have the function that are defined in H1 square that are polynomial on the boundary, continuous polynomial on the boundary of degree K and then they have to satisfy this Stokes problem. Uh, in the previous uh, presentation of Manu, we see that here we had uh, a Poisson type problem because uh, uh, we had a different uh, uh, problem and so uh, this is a Stokes like problem that uh, is similar to the one that we are studying. The main property of this uh, uh, particular uh, space of function is the fact that the divergence of the velocity has to be a polynomial of degree k minus 1. And this uh, is the same space that uh, you use to approximate the, the space of the pressure. This is an important property, so the divergence of a, velocity, a discrete velocity function is included into the space of the discrete pressure, and this leads to uh, an exactly discrete divergence-free uh, velocity. It's quite difficult to say this. <laughs> <laughs> So, to handle uh, this type of function, you need uh, some suitable set of degrees of freedom. And uh, for the velocity, you had four sets, the evaluation at the vertices of each polygon, the evaluation at the k-1 distinct points uh, of uh, uh, each edge, uh, these uh, are uh, typically chosen as the gauss lobato quadrato rules, some uh, moments of the velocity uh, in this uh, space uh, and uh, some uh, moments up to the degree k minus 1 of the divergence. While for the pressure we just uh, take the moments up to the degree k minus 1 of the pressure. Here we just have uh, two examples of uh, an element. Here we have the degree 2 for a pentagon and here the degree 3 for uh, also a pentagon. We have highlighted the, the, all the degrees of freedom. So, with this choice of the degrees of freedom, we are able to discretize the bilinear form. Uh, we just say that the bilinear form B the, doesn't need any approximation because we can compute exactly this term starting from the previous degrees of freedom because uh, we are testing uh, a velocity, a virtual function in the space of the velocity against the polynomial that is up to degree k minus 1. And this uh, is uh, recovered directly from this degrees of freedom, except for, the, uh, for when the Q is a constant. But you can use a, a green formula, and so you can recover the value if you know that uh, your function is a polynomial on the boundary. So with this degrees of freedom, you can exactly compute the term. 
Also, you, can, you are able to compute exactly the bilinear form A when one of the two entries is a polynomial and the other is a virtual function. And in this case, uh, you have to integrate by parts and use uh, a particular decomposition of uh, the Laplacian of a polynomial uh, of the Greek A, that is a polynomial of the Greek A minus 2, and you use this decomposition, uh, you integrate uh, again by parts, and you are able to recover this information from the previous degrees of truth. The problem comes out when you have to deal with uh, the linear form A when you test uh, with two virtual functions. And in this case, you are not able to compute exactly, so you need an approximation. And typically, and you do so, um, defining a, a discrete linear form as a sum of two contributes. The first one is uh, the so-called consistency part that consists in uh, uh, compute the uh, continuous linear form A onto some suitable projection on, of the virtual element function onto a space uh, of the polynomials. Uh, and uh, the second part is the stabi stabilization term that is uh, simply a linear form that has to scale like A. We don't uh, enter into the details of these two, but we just say that uh, we use the Doffy Doffy stabilization. So we have uh, a convergence theorem for this, uh, for this uh, method. Uh, we have uh, the correct order for the approximation of the velocity and the pressure, but we want to just underline the fact that here we don't have any dependence on the pressure. And so there is the possibility to use a reduced space for the pressure, so you can uh, um, forget about uh, have a good approximation of the pressure and use less degrees of freedom and obtain anyway uh, the same approximation for the velocity. And you do so uh, defining this, uh, you, I record here just the, the local space. And this is the local space, the, lo the space that we used also in our test. So now we can uh, uh, introduce the domain decomposition technique. It's the standard domain decomposition technique. We have the linear system that arises from the discrete problem. And we split our domain into uh, some non overlapping subdomain. We end up, we have to decompose so the velocity space that we from now we omit the h and the underscore h we will talk about every with the uh, discrete space and so the velocity space uh, has to be is defined is uh, split into two contributes two components the space vi that is made by function that lives on the uh, on each subdomain and the space V gamma hat that is made by function that lives on the interface of the subdomains. And the space Q that is uh, for the pressure also split into a space QI that is made by function that uh, lives on each subdomain that has uh, mean null on the subdomains and a space Q0 that is made by function that are constant on uh, each uh, subdomain. With this uh, the composition we can rewrite our uh, uh, saddle point problem in this way and by static condensation we can just uh, eliminate the interior variables and came out uh, with the uh, interface global uh, uh, problem that is this one and that uh, is the problem that we want to speed up and uh, where, we, where we want to apply our precondition so the BBC preconditioner has a, a wide literature. It was uh, introduced in the 2006 by Wiglund and uh, also in the 2004 by Dorman with uh, another article. And, this, and uh, they have been uh, widely applied to uh, FEM, uh, other type of FEM, other type of methods. And in the last year, they have been uh, applied also to the virtual element. So uh, to handle this preconditioner, we need to introduce another space that is a partial ascended interface velocity space that is uh, constituted by the uh, two spaces. The first one is the space V primal uh, hat and is the continuous global space, the coarse uh, space that is made uh, by function that uh, lives uh, on the uh, primal nodes that typically are the vertices of uh, the subdomains and other uh, and other nodes under other degrees of freedom on each edge uh, of the subdomains. 
and a space uh, V delta is the dual space, and that is made by function that vanish on the primal nodes. To handle this preconditioner, you have to take care of with these uh, three spaces. The first one we have seen before is the space of the function that lives on the interface and that are continuous on all the interfaces. The space V uh, tilde, that is the space uh, of function that are continuous on the primal nodes and discontinu typically discontinuous on the dual nodes. And a space V gamma without uh, hat or tilde, that is the space, the simply the product space that is generally discontinuous. To handle these three spaces, you have to jump from check you. You, uh, you have to jump from uh, one space to another, and so to do so, you need some restriction operators, and also you need uh, an, uh, a scaling operator that uh, is defined simply as one uh, on the cardinality of uh, i x, uh, and uh, is uh, simply the number of uh, the subdomain on uh, each node that belong to. And so you need, uh, uh, with these two ingredients, you define uh, some restricted scaled operator and the average operator. And this is the key uh, operator of the BDDC because uh, is the uh, operator that uh, restores the continuity across the interface at each iteration of the uh, iterative method that you use to solve. We don't enter too much into the details, but we just say that uh, the preconditioner is this one, and it is uh, obtained as uh, the sum of uh, uh, two contributes. The, the, this one is the so-called the course correction, and this was is, is called the subdomain correction. And uh, this is obtained solving a, a normal problem on each subdomain. With this preconditioner, your, uh, uh, our uh, system, linear system, is symmetric and positive definite, so you can, we can use a preconditioner to conjugate gradient method to solve it. But this uh, happens only for a suitable choice for the primal, and, uh, for the primal constraint, and uh, uh, if uh, two assumptions are satisfied. The first one is this one, and it's called the non flux condition, and you basically require that uh, the integral of the normal component of the dual uh, velocity is equal to zero across the interface. And the second one is uh, simply related to the uh, stability of the edge average operator. To have uh, this type of property, you only need uh, as primary constraint the vertices of each subdomain. Instead, uh, to ensure that uh, also this assumption is uh, satisfied, you need to uh, impose it, to require the, this property. And so you need an extra nodes, an extra uh, degrees of freedom on each edge of the inter of, of each inter uh, of each edge of the interface. So uh, with these two assumptions, uh, so uh, also uh, I have to say that this assumption is a key assumption but because uh, uh, guarantee you that your iterates of your uh, iterative problem, iterative methods, stays uh, in this uh, uh, space that is uh, so called a uh, bending space, that is a space where uh, your preconditioner is symmetric and positive definite. And in this way, in the, you have uh, your classical uh, logarithmic uh, estimates for uh, the preconditioner. So we can now show some numerical results that we have obtained uh, uh, solving a problem with a uh, known solution, but uh, uh, we have uh, just uh, performed the test in a serial code in MATLAB, and uh, uh, so we can just look at the iteration count and the, um, the eigenvalue estimate when possible. We compare here three different uh, uh, resolution of our system. The first one is made by GMRS. The second one is made by the BDDC with the BDDC preconditioner with the only the vertices as the primary constraint. And the third one is the BDDC where we put uh, also an extra uh, edge, uh, an extra degrees of freedom for each edge uh, of the interface. We see that in this we uh, highlighted in blue the weak scale, the iteration related to the weak scaling, the red, the uh, strong scaling, and look uh, 
in this direction, so in horizontal you can uh, see the optimality of uh, our method. The GMRS doesn't uh, work so well. The VDDC with only vertices uh, seems to have a good behavior on the quadrilateral mesh, but we are not able to estimate the eigenvalue because uh, in this case the problem is not symmetric and positive definite. And uh, in this way we have uh, uh, satisfied both the true assumption and so we are able to see the estimate, the estimate for the eigenvalues and we see that the iteration has uh, the good behavior in uh, all the terms. So we have a logarithmic growth here, here and we, they didn't grow uh, they didn't grow with uh, increasing the number of the supplement. We tested also on a Voronoi mesh. We have basically the same result, but uh, clearly the number of iteration and the conditioning number is uh, a little higher. And we also tested another uh, type of primal space. Instead of having uh, just only one uh, degrees of freedom for each, from, for each edge, we increase the space, so we consider two basis functions for each edge, and in this case we see a better converge, a better behavior of the precondition, and we see a faster convergence. And this is a good fact because increasing just a little bit the core space, you gain a lot of uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, speed uh, of convergence. We have just uh, re recorded here the plot for the optimality here and the weak scaling here with using one fun basis function for each edge and two basis function for each edge. And uh, that's it. So now we are working on the three-dimensional case with uh, it's a joint work with Franco Dassi and uh, Simone Scacchi and also Stefano Zampini. And uh, we have uh, planned to extend uh, this uh, method to other type of problems or uh, uh, also to time dependence problem like and other schools. Thank you for your attention. Okay, is there any question from the audience? Please. Tomorrow, did you try to get bounds on the condition number of the two condition system using the two condition? Do you have some theoretical estimates? Or is it just numerical? No, no, we have a theoretical estimate. No, sorry. Yeah, theoretical estimate that go an upper bound the condition number of the pre condition matrix using this pre condition. Oh, yeah. The, the, the lowest eigenvalue is uh, 1. We have an estimate that the lowest eigenvalue is 1. Mm -hmm. And the higher eigenvalue is estimated by this. Okay, yeah. So you have an H dependency still, which you see that in your numerical experiments. Oh, no. No, sorry, I. Yeah, so looking for this H dependency at the mesh side that you have in the upper bound, which we see then in the in the experiments. Okay. Okay. Ah. <laughs> so it's asking my question. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, oh, because no. you're seeing that when the age gets finer and finer, oh, yes, 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 the condition works. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to check that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes, you have uh, a logarithmic growth. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Basically. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Is there any other question from the audience, please? Um, to construct the coarse grid, uh, yes. you follow a particular uh, uh, way or uh, the, the coarse grid? Yes, the because you have the coarse grid correction to build the preconditioner. Yes. So how do you construct the coarse the, grid? The coarse space of ma uh, you, you say in, uh, the implementative. Yes. Uh, you you just take the uh, the vertices of oh, the okay. of each subdomain. And then you uh, operate changing of the base for the uh, interface, mm -hmm. and you select as a primal uh, nodes another uh, degrees of freedom that you construct that represent the integral of the velocity across the okay. the, no the normal of the velocity across the interface. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other question from the audience? Yes. I just have a curiosity the definition of the locus virtual space. Yeah. There is a function s. Okay, then my question is, who is this function and whether it appears in the representation mm, of the method? It's simply an uh, uh, L2 function. You you don't have any... But it disappears in, at some point mm. because it no, doesn't no, appear. No, no, it doesn't appear. Oh. It's just to fix the problem to give your uh, definition. Okay. Uh, well, I, I think so.
because you just to fix this case, I think. Uh, maybe it's related to the Helmholtz decomposition because um, you want to add something that oh, is yes. not seen the Helmholtz decomposition. Oh, probably, yeah. And then, so because mm -hmm. you know you can choose any elliptic problem in the Helmholtz definition. Yeah? So mm -hmm. you, you take one that takes care of your vorticity equation and one that takes care of your Helmholtz of the, the part that is not seen by the vorticity equation. So you should do I'm Helmholtz. not an expert of this. <laughs> <laughs> me, me, me. <laughs> but are you aware of all the work by, exactly here, are you aware of all the work by Linke on fractional robust methods? Uh, no. Uh, so, uh, this is something that you see very often in uh, finite element, classical yes, finite element. Yes. So the idea is, uh, if you have this discrete property, the fact that the discrete divergence is included yes, in, in the, the space of... The then you have a method which is pressure robust in the yeah. sense that if you have high pressure, you don't, you, you, what you did, you depop the yeah. L, right? Yes. And this is also in Bretzi, Bob B and Fortan. Yes. Uh, but, but so first of all, the, the, the closest you get to, 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 to writing here is Scott Vogelius, right? Which is you yes. take P4, uh, P4 and no, P3 uh, discontinuous, three, right? P3 or maybe is uh, 5 and 4, I don't remember. 4 and 3, four four and four four and four four or 5 and 4, four five four four anyway. Uh, but so you need to go very high. Very high. So yeah. the idea is that if you use a van method, you can go... You, you can go... Uh, with we use the you can use the polynomial of debris two for example. Okay, so you fix that problem that you yes. end up having with, with pressure robust methods, yes. and this is very interesting. The pro the problem is clearly that the the VAM uh, require it doesn't have uh, require a good uh, I can say uh, you don't have a, an element of re reference. So ah, when, yes, you so when you code it, it's a nightmare, but uh, yes, yes, that's for people that code. Uh, <laughs> uh, then I have another question, which comes on another point. So when you have a scott Vogelius element, what you end up having is a strong restriction on your compatible mesh. In the sense that if you are working with, with a mesh in which all angles are oppositely equal, so let's mm -hmm. say, for example, you are doing, working with a crisscross mesh, mm -hmm. You lose the sub condition. Okay. Do you see something like this, or you also get away with working with whatever mesh you want? So if you use a crisscross mesh, this works because if this works with a crush mesh I didn't and low I polynomial order, order, you have fixed two of the mm. greatest problems that imply not using Scott Vogelius uh, for this. I don't know because I don't try it. Um, oh, but this is very but interesting. It could be a good idea to try it. Yes, this is amazing. Okay. So, is there any other question from the audience? If not, I have another one. So, um, <laughs> and did you also have a non conform So, this is all conforming, right? Yes. Do you also try some non conforming yeah. Okay. So, okay. No, because, there is the, because another approach is using non conforming, non -conforming for yes. obtaining exactly that. Mm. Thank you. So, if there is no other question from the audience or from me, uh, <laughs> we can thank the speaker. <laughs>